Probability part one. I'm just talking through some slides I used in one of the lessons for the sake of those who weren't there. At various points you're probably going to want to pause this screencast and do some of the questions out of the notes. We'll be looking at the probability scale, expected frequencies, those questions about bags of balls being shaken up and things picked out of them. That brings us on to the idea of mutually exclusive events, the use of possibility space diagrams, and then the important idea of independent events. Part two will look at tree diagrams. Probability scale. You know, if you stop people on the street and ask them questions about coins and dice, they'll probably get the answer right. So the chance of getting ahead on a coin is 50-50, one in two. But in maths, we, we prefer to talk about things in a more precise way. So we talk about the probability of an event being a fraction on a scale from naught, where it won't happen, to one, which is complete certainty. Most things are in the middle somewhere. Uh, when I say a fraction, it can be a, a percentage, it can be a decimal, or it can be a, a fraction with a top and a bottom, like a, a proper fraction. The formula that can be used to calculate probabilities in simple cases with things like coins and dice and, and cards is simply to take the number of ways you win, or the number of design outcomes, and divide it by the number of equally likely possible outcomes. So, for instance, in the case of the coin, there's one way of getting ahead, so the top of the fraction is one, and there are two possible outcomes, so the bottom of the fraction is two. Talking of coins, Percy Diaconis, uh, a professor of mathematics in New York, has discovered that if you toss a coin heads up and catch it, there is a very small possibility that it'll land heads up, very small extra probability that it'll land heads up. It's a very small effect, but he's done the analysis and it's actually quite fascinating. Expected frequencies. The expected frequency of something happening is the probability of that event times the number of trials. So if you uh, toss a coin 100 times, you'd expect to get 50 tails on the coin. doesn't always work. If I simulate it on a spreadsheet here, as you can see, when we actually do the experiment, most of the time it's close to 50 heads, but not quite. If I do a whole run of experiments, I actually use 30 coins on this experiment you can see that most of the outcomes are fairly close to 15 heads, which is what you'd have expected, but there are some quite large uh, de deviations or divergences. So observed frequencies aren't always the same as expected frequencies. And now onto the bags of balls questions, which examiners love so much, uh, mainly because it's an easy sam example of a random process. You've got five red balls, two blue balls, and three green balls in a bag. You shake up the bag. You can't see in the bag. You shake the bag up. Somebody else picks one at random. It's the, it's the lottery idea. What's the probability of getting a red one? Well, there are five ways of getting a red one, going back to that fundamental formula. And there are ten possible outcomes. You add up all the balls in the bag. So it's five-tenths or a half. What's the probability of getting not a green one? Well, that's quite clever. You can start saying, well, I've got two red ones. Uh, sorry five red ones, two blue ones, that makes seven not green, so that's seven tenths. Another way of working it out, which could be useful, is to say, well, something's got to happen, so all the probabilities add up to one, and I've got a three tenths chance of getting a green one. So I must therefore have a one minus three tenths, or seven tenths chance of getting a not green one. That can be useful under certain circumstances. What's the probability of getting a yellow one? Well, zero, because there isn't a yellow one in the bag. You might get little trick questions like that on some of the practice material we use, but you'll never get an exam question based on anything like that. Suppose you picked a green ball and then did not put the ball back in the bag, you kept it on the bench. That alters some of the probabilities, so now there's only nine balls left. So what's the probability of getting a green one again? Well, you've got nine balls, but there's only two green ones left because you took one of them out. So that's two ninths. What's the probability of getting a red ball? Well, the five red balls are still there because the first one you picked out was a green, so that's five over nine. You can get quite subtle little questions like that. So I think you better do some practice. Exercise 1, unit 19, page 3. Exercise 2, unit 19, page 5. And remember that the probability of something not happening is 1 minus the probability that it happens. That can come in quite handy. You might want to pause the screencast now, wait wait for the next until you've done the exercise before looking at the next bit. 
Mutually exclusive events. I normally explain mutually exclusive events by using an old-fashioned telly. Remember the days when you had to get up to change the channel? There are four push buttons. One would be pressed in, say BBC One. When you wanted to change to BBC Two, you had to press that button and the first one popped out. That gives the idea that you can only have one alternative of the four or five or six mutually exclusive events. Another example would be there's three sandwiches left in the canteen. Egg, cheese, chicken. You have to pick one of them, but you can only pick one of them. So it has to be either egg or cheese or chicken. When you hear yourself saying the word or, that's often the, uh, an indicator of mutually exclusive events. A, the probability of A or B you can find by adding up the probability of A then adding up the probability of B. As a concrete, oh, or means add in probability always. As a concrete example, suppose you wanted to know the probability of rolling a 4 or a 6 on a die. You would take the probability of the 4, which is a 6th, add it to the probability of the 6, which is also a 6th. You get 2 sixths, which cancels down to a third. That leads on to the idea of possibility space diagrams. Suppose, this is best demonstrated by a concrete example, suppose you had two dice, one red, one blue. You add the scores on each dice to find your total score. There are 36 equally likely outcomes. So suppose you got one on the red, you can have one, two, three, four, five, or six on the blue. Same if you get two on the red. So for each red score, there are six possible blue scores. Six sixes are 36. But there's only 11 different scores because the smaller score you can get is one plus one, and a larger score is six plus six, or 12. So there are going to be different numbers of different scores, aren't there? The situation's best displayed in a table. See how I've made a table with the red dice along the top, blue dice down the side, and the black numbers inside the table are the different possible scores. Straight away, there are six ways of getting seven. So that means that your, the probability of getting a seven score when you roll two dice is six over 36, which cancels down to give a sixth. Now on an exam paper, you might have a partially completed table like that to fill in. Then they can start asking you questions like, what's the probability of getting a score bigger than eight? Well, four plus three plus two plus one, I make that 10. So that's 10 over 36, which is five eighteenths. They can also ask you questions that loop back to your knowledge of maths. So they might ask you, what's the probability of getting a prime number score? So you have to remember what a prime number is. Well, I reckon there are 15 prime numbers between 2 and um, in, in that table, because 7 counts 6 times, of course, not 15 different prime numbers. So the probability is 15 over 36, which cancels down to give 5 twelfths. Looking now at independent events, an independent event is when the outcome of one trial cannot possibly affect the outcome of another trial. For example, tossing a coin or rolling a dice, or indeed rolling two dice, like the situation we've just looked at. When you're tossing a coin or rolling a dice, the probability of getting a head is a half, and the probability of getting, say, a five is one-sixth. When you multiply them together, you get one-twelfth. And that expresses the idea that it's harder to get both a head and a five. That's one outcome out of twelve possible outcomes, as opposed to just sort of getting a head. So and means multiply in probability. It has been suggested that there aren't any actual independent events in nature. Edward Lorentz, whose photograph's there, asked the question, does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? And surprisingly enough, the answer is probably yes. Just do a web search on butterfly effect if you're interested. That's not on the GCSE exam. In summary, the expected frequency is the probability of the event times the number of trials you do. It may be different to the observed frequency. All means add, and you've got mutually exclusive events. And means multiply when you've got independent events. And if you do some more work on page 5, unit 37, you'll find some relatively challenging questions which test your knowledge of all this. And that brings us to the end of part 1 of probability.